Hello everyone. Welcome back. I believe this is our 21st broadcast. That's three octaves, three times seven. <clears throat> um, seven is the mystical number. It's a number of, of deeper esoteric information. And we will discuss that at one of these broadcasts, the deeper meaning of numbers, um, where numerology comes from, how numerology is uh, associated with letters of the alphabet and words and language and meaning, and seeing as uh, this time we are uh, continuing down that path and we're talking about deep language, the deep language of our uh, biological system. Um, I want to um, uh, pop up here the address for um, today's soundtrack at the end. <clears throat> Scientificsounds.com slash deep dash language. In addition, for um, all of you who are tuning in for the first time, this is your first time here, um, I encourage you to go back uh, into YouTube and <clears throat> this is the address for that, uh, https bit.ly Dr. Thompson Live. There you will see the complete list in order um, and the order is backwards so the most recent broadcast will be at the top and the very first broadcast will be at the bottom. <clears throat> but all, all the way back to April 5th, I believe, was my first broadcast. Um, if you haven't seen them, um, I encourage you to go and watch them in order because each one of these broadcasts builds on the broadcast before that. <clears throat> it's a string of information where every part um, links to information that I have covered in the past. And then some of the places in the past, some of that information, um, <clears throat> I go so far with it, and in a later broadcast, I will pick up at that point and go deeper into it. Uh, so today is no exception. Um, the last time where we talked about the hero's journey and how that's extended in to the, the way of story passed down through generations, countless generations before the written word. Things were passed by story, and those stories had great deep meaning of the great lessons of life in story form. <clears throat> and the greatest uh, lesson of all was the hero's journey, which is our own journey. Each of us has the hero's journey that we are going through in our own life. And each of us goes through the same <clears throat> kind of um, issues that the hero goes through in these great journeys, which, which is the general theme of believing that you're ordinary and that the world is ordinary and that you're nothing special. And then you find out that that's not true, that you are indeed something extremely special. And then you're called upon for the great quest and you rise to the occasion when you think it's not possible for you, and you conquer uh, and find your way home. <clears throat> so uh, we also talked about uh, some of the great luminaries, um, Carl Jung and Milton Erickson, um, and uh, the work uh, with uh, dream and hypnosis, um, which once, away, once again goes into the language of the unconscious mind, which is dream imagery, where you create an entire world and you populate it with the rules of that world. And it's uh, so engaging that you don't actually know that you're in a sort of a hypnagogic dreamlike state. <clears throat> but various of of these great practitioners, like in this case here, Carl Jung, in particular used techniques of hypnosis to access that area of the unconscious mind and uh, create guided 
dreams, guided, guided journeys, guided shamanic journeys. Um, and in that quest, particularly for um, Carl Jung, he stumbled across a number of different things. He also was a great explorer of uh, Eastern uh, religions and esoteric sciences. He chased all that stuff down. He was interested in all of that. And that was pretty much the reason why he broke away from Sigmund Freud, because Freud was steeped in a Western culture only, a materialistic culture, uh, which basically was, um, you know, from the viewpoint that all of our problems were stemming from survival and sexual issues. And Jung didn't buy that one at all. <clears throat> so he explored a lot of different things uh, from the East, a real explorer. And he used that in his practice. In particular, um, he did past life regressions with people in hypnagogic states. Um, for instance, this is Atlantis, so people would travel back to Atlantis and believe that they had remembered a lifetime in Atlantis and would live through live that out, and he would guide that. Um, and 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 he would. Um, <coughs> Atlantis here. Um, so he would help people guide themselves through that um, sort of remembering of a past lifetime. And in that would be a story. And in that story would be the resolution of some deep problem. And once that was resolved uh, and uh, successfully, um, you know, sometimes it would be Egypt, ancient Egypt. That seems to be a famous one for most people, <clears throat> believing that you were some queen or that you were uh, uh, some kind of a temple guardian or a, a priest. Um, uh, and his statement was it didn't matter to him whether past life, uh, past life memories actually truly exist or not. Uh, if it just happened to be the image that your subconscious mind required to clothe itself in in order to deal with an issue successfully, and the issue got handled successfully, then it really didn't make any difference whether past life progressions actually were real or not. Uh, and so his attitude f uh, about that was sort of truly, as a scientist, an open mind. If somehow in his studies he could find out that there was truth to it, then that would be that would be cool. Uh, if not, it doesn't matter anyway because the language of the unconscious mind could explain it. Um, he also had a thing that he that showed up so many times in his practice: um, this idea of synchronicities, coincidences with a capital C. Um, he wrote a few books about this synchronicity idea. Um, <clears throat> for instance, here's one of his great quotes, is synchronicity, a meaningful coincidence of two or more events where something other than the probability of chance is involved. Which means it's not a coincidence, it's a synchronicity. Um, and he had a famous story uh, where he had a a female patient who he was had put through a hypnosis series of treatments, past life progressing back to a time in Egypt, uh, where she was some kind of a princess or something and dealing with some kind of deep issue at her unconscious level. And the core of that whole thing was a uh, Egyptian scarab. The Egyptian scarab was uh, a big deal, and it was a golden scarab. <clears throat> and while she was on his couch in a state of hypnosis on a summer evening, a June bug, which is basically a scarab, flew in the window and landed on her blouse, looking just like the one she was describing in her hypnotic session. Now, June bugs are usually this iridescent kind of a greenish color, but this particular June bug was golden color, just like the one she was describing in her unconscious state. 
and he used this one famously in a couple of his books, this illustrated story about an example of a synchronicity event uh, where something so powerful happens at a collective unconscious level that it actually manifests as a synchronicity out here in the macro world. Um, <clears throat> Synchronicity is an ever-present reality for those who have eyes to see. And this is a theme that we see a lot in the 20th, 21st century. This idea that, uh, and particularly I've talked about this before, where you walk down the path and there's a fork and you're fated to walk the path and fated to make a free will decision. And every time you make the free will decision for the betterment of your soul, where you can't see how that's going to work itself out. It's not your job to see that, it's the universe's job to supply that. And when the universe does that, a series of synchronicities begin to show up in your life. Um, the lights turn green, the doors open by themselves, the wrong phone call is the right person, and on and on and on. These, these serendipity-like synchronicities begin to show up in your life because you are now, as I call it, dancing with the universe you're tangoing together. And the clear sign that you're on that path, on the right path, is that the synchronicities begin to show. And the more they show, the more you can see them. When you become attuned and more sensitive to the big synchronicities, you be, become, it becomes easier for you to see the more subtle synchronicities and signs and the omens that the ancients talked about the signs and the omens, and pretty soon your sensitivity gets uh, so acute that you see that your entire life is filled with omens and synchronicities. Um, it's not a rare event. It's something that happens all the time all around us. And our indigenous selves, our, our ancient ancestors, were well tuned into these kind of ideas. The idea of the totem animals and the different signs that would show up and the omens that would show up. Uh, deeper <clears throat> was this idea of the collective, the collective unconscious. And it's the reason why I, why I dwell uh, more on Carl Jung, because I, he was a deep influence on my work and particularly the collective unconscious is what we're attempting to do here with these live streams by synchroni synchronizing everybody's brain waves through headphones with a single soundtrack that brain entrains everyone together to a single place, uh, aligning the collective unconscious. Here the collective unconscious contains the whole spiritual heritage of mankind's evolution born anew in the brain structure of every individual. And I'm going to flesh this out, what he was talking about here. This statement um, that the spiritual heritage of mankind's evolution is born anew in the brain structure of every individual uh, is something uh, that came from his study of uh, these ancient texts from China called the I Ching. <clears throat> so just as we had talked about the ancient texts from India, which I spent a lot of time, uh, the Vedas and uh, Upanishads and the Sutras of Padanjali, these almost 4,000 year old texts, um, the only, the oldest texts on earth, by the way, um, except for the Chinese texts of the I Ching. So this is right up there on a par with the Vedas, equally as old, with her tradition that goes into pre-written history, just like the ancient traditions of the uh, from the Indian culture before it was written down in um, were oral traditions that passed from generation to generation for thousands of years. The same thing with the Chinese, until in the Qing Wen Dynasty, around four thousand years ago, the first written texts of the I Ching were put down to paper. Um, <clears throat> the study of the I Ching um, has been my life's work. I first came across the I Ching 
in um, 1966, um, a friend of mine gave me the book. This was the book he gave me, the Wilhelm Baines edition of the I Ching right here. That is the one to have. It's a hardbound book. Um, usually after a while the cover ends up disappearing and it's this beautiful yellow book. Um, <clears throat> now this book is the embodiment of Chinese wisdom in one book. And the um, Wilhelm Baines edition is the most profound translation that I know of. I have uh, purchased all kinds of different I Ching books from all kinds of different authors to compare to see what different translations look like. And by far the Wilhelm Baines is the most amazing. Um, the <coughs> The Wilhelm Baines edition also has, um, it, it's n not just a book of wisdom, but it's a book of divination. It's an oracle. You can consult the I Ching by either throwing three coins or doing a ceremony with 50 yarrow stalks. And <clears throat> the yarrow stock method was the ancient traditional method, which in more modern times changed, I mean modern times uh, a thousand years ago, changed to coins, which is a shorter method of getting a read out. Um, and <clears throat> the book is divided up, this particular book uh, is divided up into three sections. The first section of this book is a, a sort of an introduction treatise on the I Ching, what it is how to use it to divine an answer. And then the middle portion of the text is uh, an analysis of all the 64 kind of ways that you can come up with something called a hexagram, which I'll explain here. <clears throat> These yarrow stocks. So uh, also the introduction of this version of the I Ching, the Wilhelm Baines edition, the, the the introduction of this book is written by Carl Jung, uh, and it has commentaries on the hexagrams written by Confucius himself. So this really is a mind blower of a book. Um, uh, and in that introduction, uh, Carl Jung discusses these yarrow stocks, the traditional method, where the yarrow, this is yarrow right here, the yarrow stocks were supposed to be gathered from the graves of your own ancestors. And <clears throat> doing a ceremony with the stocks was called consulting the ancestors. If you think about it for a minute, if these plants were grown off the uh, graves of your own ancestors, then their body would have been fertilizer and their essence would be in this plant. So by chopping these stalks off in a bundle, um, you would have a bundle of stalks that were grown from the fertilizer of your own ancestors' bodies and their essence, their kind of DNA thing would be in here. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to get into the whole how you do the ceremony of dividing these stalks and counting them in order to do the divination. Um, but this, this was the deep meditative ceremony to consult the I Ching. Um, this is a statement by him. Uh, For more than 30 years, I have interested myself in this oracle, an oracle technique or method of exploring the unconscious. For it has seemed to me of uncommon significance. And the reason for that is because um, these 64 hexagrams, these 64 answers that are possible are symbolic uh, symbols and the Chinese are famous for that. The Chinese language is a right brain language which, which has um, symbolic images that have more than one meaning and depending on how they're 
aligned together, the meaning of each is changed by the one next to it, and that comes up with the interpretation. Very different from the linear way that English is put together, where each word has a meaning in Chinese. The Chinese symbols do not have a single meaning. Um, so in this idea of the I Ching with the hexagrams, each of those symbols was interpreted depending on other aspects, which I'll explain a little bit here. Um, <clears throat> here's how it works. This is the grand yin-yang symbol, and the light part is the grand yang male principle, and the dark part is the grand female principle. Um, as I said before, in, in the past, even in the Upanishads, it talked about God in the infinite form divided into two halves at the moment of orgasm, and that became this. Uh, and then they fall apart, and they go through the chase where the female tries to hide from the male by jumping into a sheep form, and he jumps into a ram form and creates all rams and on and on. Uh, this is the Chinese version of that same idea. So now we have a representation of the male principle as a solid line and of the female principle as a broken line. And this is the receptive and the receiving, and this is the phallic symbol. Uh, and then if we double these lines, we have four great possibilities here, right? Two solid ones, a solid and a broken on top, and a broken on bottom, and two brokens. Uh, so the greater and lesser yang, and the greater and the lesser yin. And then these, if we add one more, we have what's called trigrams. So there's only four mathematical ways of having these digrams. Eight possible mathematical ways of having eight trigrams. So you can see how each of these is a little different from the one before. And these represented the eight primal forces of nature in in China. Heaven, lake, fire, with the broken line in the middle. Its opposite would be water, solid line in the middle, um, thunder, wind, mountain, earth. Great eight directions. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so once again, male, female, uh, the yin-yang symbol, and the uh, male principle comes into a solid line, female into a broken line. Uh, and then we double this and it goes into the four great possibilities of greater and lesser yang, greater and lesser yin. And then these combine into a third one. This, these are called the eight trigrams, because there's three. <clears throat> so like I said, heaven, lake, here's fire with a broken line in between. Its opposite is water. Uh, thunder, wind, mountain, earth. And so that's the eight great uh, primal forces of nature arranged in a uh, compass heading where we have north and south and east and west and uh, different seasonal things are associated with each one as well. Times of day associated with each one. So this is the basic setup. Now if we take these eight trigrams, because there's only eight possible ways of combining three things together like this, and we double them, we end up with 64 hexagrams uh, that look like this. So these would be the lower trigrams, and these would be the upper trigrams. And where we bring one down and cross it over to the other, we get the 64 hexagrams that show up. All 64 possible mathematical ways that eight trigrams can combine together. Every once in a while, you'll see <clears throat> that the top trigram and the bottom trigram are identical. So that's this one. The top one and the bottom one are identical. You see that? These three here are the same as these three here. And that goes in a line down diagonally, where each of these is a doubling at the top and the bottom. So this represents the eight 
extra super primal forces of nature. And they would be called that. This would be called heaven, right? And this one here would be called fire, etc. Uh, this is a chart that you actually practically use in the book. So if I show you my book here. At the, in the back of this book, there's a page that shows essentially the same thing. And it shows looking, the, looking up the top trigram and the bottom trigram. And in here is the number of the trigram and how you look that up in the book. So, and we'll see. Here's, here's a hexagram with its number, with a text that shows, it reads the imagery of this and gives you a readout of which hexagram you've got. <clears throat> In addition, <clears throat> since there's eight of these trigrams, the primal forces, that is one complete octave. So that's C to C, one octave higher. Uh, seven notes in an octave, and then beginning the next octave. So that means that there's an actual note, a musical tone for each of these eight trigrams. <clears throat> and when we combine one trigram with another, it means we have two tones for um, each hexagram. Each of the 64 hexagrams has a different two-tone combination relationship, which is a primitive chord. So all 64 hexagrams actually have a tone associated with them, a, a double tone chord associated with them. Uh, when you get deeper into this, there are nuclear hexagrams. Um, I actually did my senior thesis in art school, my fourth year completely on the I Ching, uh, calculating all of the um, nuclear hexagrams. So for instance, this hexagram here, we've got these three lines which forms the top trigram. These bottom three lines are the lower trigram. But if we take these top three lines and then start with this, the next one here and take three down and combine those into a hexagram, that's another nuclear hexagram. If we take these bottom three lines and then the next line and its three that forms another nuclear hexagram. Uh, and then we take these three lines and these three lines and another hexagram and the opposite way and we have five, five nuclear hexagrams. So hidden within each of these hexagrams are five additional hexagrams, each with two note correspondences, which gives us a uh, seven uh, a, a seven scale um, two note chord. So we can construct a complex chord from each of these 64 hexagrams. And that's one of my many projects that I'm working on. Um, so this is what I just showed you in the book. Here we have right here, forward by Carl Jung. Um, this is how we figure out a hexagram, so we take the lower trigram and the upper trigram, and that forms the hexagram. You can see this one here is on top, and this one here is on bottom, and that's hexagram number 14. If we have fire, this one is symbol for fire. We find it up here. There it is right there. And the symbol for heaven, which is this one right here, and we follow those two. That's hexagram number 14 right there. That's the practical way that you find out. Here's how you consult. Oh, let's go back. So once again, here's the forward by Carl Jung. Yeah. Uh, here's the uh, lower trigram and the upper trigram. So this one is uh, the hexagram for called fire, and so this one here is on top, and these three are on bottom. 
And so if we want to look this up, this one up, we would find the top trigram in the upper trigram section, which is here. And we would find the bottom one, these three bro uh, solid lines here. And we cross them over and we end up with number 14, which is hexagram 14. So that's kind of how we use this uh, in the back of the book in a practical way to find out which hexagram we got. So how do we get this hexagram? Uh, with the coins, it's pretty easy. So we have three coins, and there's four possible ways for three coins to come up. Um, you can have three tails, or three heads, or two tails and head, or two heads and a tail. That's pretty much it. And because um, odd numbers are male and even numbers are female, you assign a number value for each of these. So the tails equals three and the heads equals two. So if I get three tails, I get three, six, nine. So this actually would be um, Uh, so let's go to this next one here. Here's somebody who's taken the stalks and they have thrown a hexagram with the stalks and you can see where they got uh, an eight. That would be um, if a, a tail is three, right? A tail and a tail would be six and a head would be two, so that would be an eight. So this got one head, two tails. This one got three tails, three, six, nine. Now the reason they've made this mark here is because from the standpoint of the Chinese, if you get a preponderance of the same, three tails or three heads requires a special cosmic energy to make all three align exactly the same with with uh, no kind of um, opposites in there. So this would be a preponderance of energy of the female aspect. And it would be so powerful that whatever line it equaled, that would be uh, 2, 4, 6, would switch into its opposite and become a 9. And you'd make a mark there. So 2, 4, five, six, seven, that's an odd number, so that's male, so that's a solid line. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that's an even number, so that's a female, so that's a broken line. But three, six, nine is an odd number, that's a male line, but it flips over into its opposite female line and starts a new hexagram, so you end up with two hexagrams which is what this is showing. This line and this line would flip over here into their opposite female lines and all these other ones would stay the same and form a new hexagram, like this. So here we have this line is the one that changed. So this meant they, they threw three tails, two, four, six. But because of preponderance of tails, it flipped into its opposite and became a male line. But all the rest of these were regular. They did not change. They were either two tails and a head or two heads and a tail. And so these transferred over without changing and this is the only one that changed and so these two hexagrams are different and when you look them up these are the general title for each of these two hexagrams. And that's how you kind of use this I Ching as a way of divining. You you take these coins and you, so here are my my stalks. I did not, um, you know, gather these from the graves of my ancestors because we don't do those kind of things here in the U.S. I keep a special little envelope and in that envelope I have all of the previous okay, pull one of these pages out. I keep every hexagram reading I've ever done 
on a sheet and you can see I, I'll put a date and I'll put the question that I was asking and I will show what the hexagram name was and what its number was. So I could always go back and say, wow, back in such and such um, April 1st, 2020, I had a general hexagram I threw on the coronavirus that was just arising, that was becoming a pandemic. Um, I also have um, an envelope within the envelope, and this envelope is my coins. <clears throat> if I jump those out. These are my coins. So you can see I've got a bunch of different ones. Uh, and one side is different than the other. This one is tails and that one's heads. This one's easier to see. This one is, if I can get that to focus. Anyway, that one has two marks on it, that's heads. This one has f four marks on it, and that's tails. I wish I could get the camera to focus on that, but I can't. Yeah. Three of these coins that I have are 500 years old, and it's not, e and it's not so hard to find those in Chinatown. Um, So this idea of picking the arrow stalks from the graves of your own ancestors, where their DNA is locked up into the stalks themselves, uh, Jung was interested in this because it was a way of consulting your unconscious mind. Because the reading, uh, the imagery of that hexagram lends itself to all kinds of interpretations, and the um, that's exactly what the unconscious mind does best, is jump to a conclusion. For instance, um, let's just choose one at random. This one here is hexagram number 17, and it's called following. And the two hexagram, the two trigrams are the joyous lake above and the arousing thunder underneath. And so that brings an image to your mind, um, a lake with arousing thunder under it. What does that even mean? Um, and then it will start to explain that whole thing to you. And as you read the interpretation, the interpretation is broad enough that it allows your unconscious mind to jump to the conclusions it already knows is so inside. So it really is a way of consulting your own unconscious mind through imagery. That's why Carl Jung was so interested in it. Um, by Carl Jung. So here was the thing where Carl Jung is talking about this yarrow stock divination with the consulting the ancestors, combined with his ideas about uh, past life regressions and memories. Um, and his take on that was that um, there is a possibility of a direct genetic memory link between me and my parents and my grandparents and all the way back. Um, and that had to do with the fact that DNA itself is a storehouse of every memory that has ever happened to me. Everything that ever happens to me is stored holographically in my DNA. It's like a memory bank. It's like a computer hard drive. So here's me, and I'm the combination of uh, 23 chromosomes from my mother and my father, which makes 46 chromosomes for me. And that means that all the memories of my mother's life from the moment she was conceived until sperm and egg came together are in this 23 chromosomes. And now I've got them. I've got all of her memories but she was past all of her mother's memories and all of her mother's memories of her father and her mother back through time. <clears throat> so I have all of those as well. 
stored in my DNA. I have all the memories of all my ancestors. And very quickly you can see that I'm the result of two people. And each of them is the result of two people. And each of them is the result of two people. And on and on. And very quickly you end up with a massive number of people in your own ancestral past. Me, my parents, each of my parents have parents, and each of those parents has parents, and each of those has parents and parents and parents and grandparents and great grandparents, and very quickly it becomes a huge number of people. Each of these is going to be two, and each of those are going to be two. So soon you end up with millions of people at the base of your pyramid as it spreads out deeper into the past. And all the memories of all those people are passed from the RNA to the DNA into the chromosomes into my, into my DNA as a storehouse of all the memories of all the people who have come before me. Uh, that in itself is a bit of a mind blower. But when you think about it, the further back in my family tree I go, the more and more and more and more people show up. Yet in history, the further we go back historically on the planet Earth, the less and less and less number of people there were in the population. So how do you rectify the two of these things? If more and more people show up in my pyramid, yet in history less and less people were in the past, the only way you can reconcile that is that everyone's pyramids, yours and mine, cross over each other at some point and we share common ancestors. We truly are genetically from one family. We are all brothers and sisters genetically linked together. And every place that my pyramid crosses over your pyramid and we share these common ancestors, we share their memories. Uh, that means that <clears throat> if all the people on earth, their past pyramids cross over each other, we all have access to the same memories of the distant ancient past. And therefore, from his standpoint, it's very possible that someone who has a past life or memory is actually a genetic trace back to a real person that actually existed uh, that they were remembering. Uh, and uh, because the numbers are so great, it's unlikely that you and I will have the same memory of exactly the same person but we could, we could have. <clears throat> so now we're going to get in, you know, because we're talking about DNA. DNA also has these four base chemistry pairs. Adenine, thymine, guanine, and uh, cytosine. And, here, and so here they are. And this is how the DNA is formed out of these four basic letters of an alphabet that can combine in all these different ways. <clears throat> so for instance, the RNA codons is three letters forms a codon. And these three letter codons can combine in all kinds of different ways. So here's the DNA formed by pyrimidines and purines just like the male and the female part of the I Ching, these form the four basic bases, and that's the four basic bases of the hexagrams, and that these combinations form the trigrams, which is the RNA, and the trigrams stacked together form the 64 codons of DNA. DNA has 64 codons, the progression is exactly mirrored in the I Ching. Um, <clears throat> that means that when I cre have a tone uh, for each of these eight tr uh, trigrams, uh, and I can create 64 hexagrams out of that, and it has a chord, I really have also chords for the 64 codons. This is the project I'm currently preparing to do, this idea of 64 complex chord arrangements for each of the codons of DNA reflected in the 64 hexagrams. 
So this idea of 64 codons, 64 hexagrams, six groups of amino acids per codon, six lines per hexagram, all of this uh, completely hangs together. Um, how did the Chinese know this? God only knows how the Chinese figured this out. They figured out acupuncture. China had a fully developed acupuncture system, and they had gunpowder, and they had rockets when Europe was still in the Stone Age, uh, still in the Bronze Age, when we were first use, you know, learning how to smelt metals. Um, I, yesterday, um, threw a hexagram. And the hexagram I threw, because I knew I was b be talking about this today, the hexagram I threw was for a broad question related to these live streams. Um, the thought that I held in mind, when you, when you shake these coins, you're supposed to clear your mind of what your question is. And the question um, for me is, was, I want a reading about these live streams and the world situation of why these live streams were created. This idea of the mind link and trying to change reality and the state of the world and all of that. Uh, and so this is the hexagram, that I, the two hexagrams that I got. And if any of you have um, I Ching books or the Wilhelm's Bain edition of the I Ching, um, I would say buy that book. Um, uh, you can write these down. I got uh, number 57 and number 40. And number 40 resulted from the fact that the top four lines were changing. Like, for instance, this top line here was a 9, so it changed to its opposite. This next one down was a 9, and that changed to its opposite. The next one down was a six, so it changed to its opposite. The next one down was a nine, it changed to its opposite. The, uh, the bottom two transferred over. Uh, gentle, wind, and deliverance were the two. I'm going to read a little bit from that, <clears throat> in case you're interested to see. So, as a matter of fact, in the uh, introduction of the I Ching, um, so Carl Jung is, is asked to write the introduction to the I Ching, the most ancient book of wisdom from one of the most ancient cultures on earth, India and China. And in the introduction, he talks about his dilemma. How am I supposed to write an introduction to a, this godlike book? I mean, how am I supposed to do that? He was intimidated. So he decided to throw an I Ching and interpret the, the hexagrams that came up and have the I Ching introduce its, itself. And that was pretty amazing because one of the two hexagrams he got was the hexagram called Ting. And Ting is the only hexagram out of all 64 hexagrams in the Book of Changes that describes a man-made object, the book. And it describes how that book is the sacrificial vessel where the food is put into the sacred vessel and offered to the gods in the temple and put on the altar. And how in this case, the food has rotted because nobody pays attention and nobody reads the book. Nobody knows about the book. Nobody uh, consults an oracle that can answer any questions. The 64 hexagrams here represent the 64 situations the 64 things, that uh, situations that you can uh, come to as a human being living your life through the journey that we all go through. There will be 64 uh, general things that you will face in life. And from the standpoint of the I Ching, your job is to find out the perfect, correct way, the the way that gets no karma to deal with any situation that comes with comes to you, and that's what the sixty-four hexagrams are there to show. <clears throat> uh, when you get one of these hexagrams, and you get one of these changing lines, the book has a separate section to discuss 
those lines, which gives you extra information about what those lines mean. So when you get a changing line in a new hexagram, you have more information to read about what that hexagram is saying. So <clears throat> the first hexagram I got about these live streams was 57, uh, which is called the gentle penetrating wind. And if you see, it's one of those doubling hexagrams where the top trigram and the bottom one are the same. So this is one of those eight uh, special hexagrams that's a doubling of the same hexagram itself. And whenever one of those shows up, it's elevated out of the normal human situation. Whenever you deal with one of those eight, um, you're dealing with a cosmic influence that is bigger than a regular situation. Uh, gentle wind. Above gentle wind, wood. Below gentle wind and wood. Sun is, uh, which is the name of this hexagram, sun, the gentle, is one of the eight doubled trigrams. It is the eldest daughter and symbolizes wind or wood. It has for its attribute gentleness, which nonetheless penetrates like the wind or like growing wood with its roots. The dark principle, which is the female broken line, in itself rigid and immovable, is dissolved by the penetrating light principle to which it subordinates itself in gentleness. In nature, it is the wind that disperses the gathering clouds, leaving the sky clear and serene in human life. It is penetrating clarity of judgment that thwarts all dark hidden motives. In the life of the community, it is the powerful influence of a great personality that uncovers and breaks up those intrigues which shun the light of day. The next section is something called the judgment. The gentle, success through what is small. It furthers one to have somewhere to go. It furthers one to see the great man. Uh, the I Ching kind of talks about crossing the great water and seeing the great man. It means um, that the, the great spiritual leaders, uh, the, 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 uh, the ancient ones who had the wisdom, were usually not approachable except in special circumstances. And when the circumstances were right, uh, it would say it furthers one to see the great man because the great man will accept you, will accept your audience. Um, penetration produces gradual and inconspicuous e effects. It should be affected not by an act of violation, but by influence that never lapses. Results of this kind are less striking to the eye than those won by surprise attack, but they are more enduring and more complete. If one would produce such effects, one must have a clearly defined goal. For only when the penetrating influence works always in the same direction can the object be attained. Small strength can achieve its purpose only by subordinating itself to an eminent man who is capable of creating order. So this to me is talking about the idea that I've talked about before, that, that I meet the universe and if I'm not active, the universe is active and I'm passive. And therefore, the universe rolls the dice and I respond to the things that happen to me. But if I have a goal, if I have a purpose, if I put pressure on the universe, if I have a vision of what I want, which is what we're trying to accomplish with these mind links, to, to um, muscle up our vision so we put pressure on the universe to conform to us and not the other way around, then we have... Um, what it says here. If one would produce such effects, one must have a clearly defined goal, for only when the penetrating influence works always in the same direction, that's all of us in the same direction, the object is attained. And then we have another section called the image here. Winds follow one upon the other, because the image of the hexagram is wind on top of wind. Winds follow one upon the other, the image of the gently penetrating. Thus the superior man spreads his commands abroad and carries out his undertakings. 
The penetrating quality of the wind depends upon its ceaselessness. This is what makes it so powerful. Time is its instrument. In the same way the rulers thought should penetrate the soul of the people, this too requires a lasting influence brought about by enlightenment and command. Only when the command has been assimilated by the people is action in accordance with it possible. Action without preparation of the ground only frightens and repels. Um, and it goes on to the four lines. And then it goes on to that second hexagram, which shows the outcome, which is in the case a very good one, um, deliverance. Um, so I would tell you all, please, uh, actually, you don't have to buy the book. You can go online, do a Google search for the Wilhelm Baines edition. And uh, that edition, you will find it. it's online. You can look it up for free. You can read those two hexagrams. Um, so the thing about the I Ching, once you start delving with the I Ching, it will always give you a mind-boggling answer. And many times it will answer the question you should have asked instead of the superficial one you did ask. Uh, so those, once you enter into that relationship, you now have a direct line of access to interpretations of imagery from your own unconscious mind. And that's the reason why Carl Jung was so interested in that. Um, this idea that, that the magic of the underlying realm within each of us, um, the sort of shamanic, magical, hero's journey zone within us <clears throat> is accessible through a variety of means. And this is one of them. Um, and the other is sound and music. So that's where we're going right now with the soundtrack. Um, the soundtrack today is another one of these magical mystery tour journeys into imagery in the unconscious. Um, and this particular one starts out with a series of different um, zones. Each zone will seem to come to a conclusion and just before it ends another zone will come in and each of those is a distinct um, a emotional shamanic uh, kind of zone, kind of experience uh, where as it works its way up towards the last zone which is the most um, uh, shamanic and magical kind of zone of all of them. <clears throat> so headphones and here we begin um,
Thank you all. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I might kind of lost my mind a few times there with not showing the right screen, so please forgive me. I'll try to be better next time. Um, uh, next time we're going to get deeper into language, NLP, uh, Neuro Linguistic Programming, uh, touch a little bit on some of the letter forms and uh, a bit of numerology, things like that. Um, as we delve deeper into how to talk with, how to communicate with the deepest regions of our unconscious mind and the deepest regions indeed of um, our uh, DNA and speak to it and reprogram it. So until next time, uh, blessings and peace and uh, everybody please be safe, uh, take care of yourselves. Until next time, uh, we'll see you next Sunday. <laughs>